Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Population Data Science webinar series. My name is Anne Greenwood. I'm the Education and Training Lead for Population Data BC, and it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today who will be speaking on the development of a prognostic prediction model to estimate the risk of multiple chronic diseases. By way of introduction, Jason Black is an epidemiologist and biostatistician who has a special interest in real-world health record analysis. He has worked extensively with the Canadian Primary Care Sentinel Surveillance Network database with a focus on predicting chronic disease incidents among primary care patients. He has also worked as a data analyst in both government and academic settings, where he has acted as a statistical lead on various projects using health administrative and electronic medical record data. So welcome, Jason. Uh, Jackie Cooper is a combined PhD candidate in epidemiology and computer science at Western University. Her research integrates epidemiology and computer science, especially machine learning, to develop, apply, and evaluate data analytic methods for supporting care decisions in primary health care settings. She is particularly interested in using this work to promote health equity for vulnerable and complex populations, such as those with multimorbidity. Her doctoral work is supported by a CIHR CGSD, and she is a recent graduate of the Pan-Canadian Transdisciplinary Understanding and Training on Research and Primary Health Care Program. So welcome, Jackie. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jason. Awesome. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, so my internet is a little bit touch and go, so I'm going to shut my video off for the duration of the presentation and then I'll bring it back at the end. Um, so yeah, so thanks so much for, to everyone for joining. I'll be talking about some of the work from my, that I did as part of my master's work a couple of years ago. So we'll be looking, we'll be chatting about um, some work I did developing a product. A prediction model that estimates the risk of multiple chronic diseases. Um, so we've got our, our contact info down on the left if you're interested in connecting with Jackie or myself. And then um, this work has been described in a publication in the International Journal of Population Data Science. So um, you can follow the QR code in the right corner if you want to read more, and I'm going to bring that QR code back at the end, so um, you don't need to worry about catching it here. Um, so just to kick things off, I want to start by acknowledging the land that I'm um, situated on right now. So I'd like to acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, the people of the three fires known as Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi Nations, and give Thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Nawash, now known as the, Ojibwe, as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. And Jackie's going to take over and quickly chat about the land that she's on. Yeah, so I'm speaking to you from Montreal, or Jojage, um, which has traditionally been a meeting and exchange grounds for many First Nations peoples, but I'm specifically on the traditional territory of the Mohawk and Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, and I've, I've put up here a map um, from initiative uh, nativeland.ca where you can actually type in your location and it'll help sort of show you what traditional land that you're on. So I encourage anyone who's unaware to, to try out that tool. And then they're also looking for people to go and verify. So just encourage you to check that out. Back to Jason. Awesome, thanks Jackie. So today I'm going to introduce a few key concepts of the work, as well as talk about the methodologic considerations that we ran into when conducting this research. I'll walk through an applied approach um, where we, we kind of applied the method that we um, developed on in a, in a case, and then Jackie's gonna take us through some discussion of that as well. So to start, I wanted to first clarify the what exactly we mean when we talk about risk, because risk is often used and not necessarily um, fully described. So when I refer to risk um, throughout this presentation, I'll be talking about how likely a person is to experience some event in the future. Uh, and that's in contrast with 
um, some sometimes we think about risk and your risk of currently having a condition, um, but I'll be talking about risk of future events. And knowledge of risk of these future events helps inform things like risk management. So how can we reduce this risk as well as screening? Um, so if we know that we, we might be at higher risk of a given condition in the future, we can start screening for that and maybe identify it a little bit earlier than if we didn't have knowledge of that risk. So there are a few tools that physicians use to estimate risk. Um, one they use is just relying on anecdotes. So based on their past experience with various patients, they might um, kind of be able to flag who is at high risk just based on their, their knowledge. That way, um, there's various heuristics to kind of understand risk. Um, they also might have knowledge of risk factors, so kind of looking at existing bodies of evidence that, that seek to understand the factors that drive risk and, and development of future disease. And they might even have knowledge of some, some odds ratios, some likelihood ratios that, that help quantify that risk. Um, and then these, these risk factors are, are quite often summarized into prognostic prediction models that are used in decision support tools. So this is a more formalized tool that is used to quantitatively estimate a risk. Um, and I just want to point out that these tools and techniques quite often focus just on a single disease at a time. Specifically looking at prognostic prediction models, um, as I mentioned, these are tools that are used by patients and their healthcare providers, and they quantify a patient's risk of some future disease using information that's known about the patient. So that can be things like risk factors. I just wanted to re reiterate here, uh, we're talking about prognostic models, or, so things that foretell. Um, and that's in contrast with diagnostic prediction models are also a common, common tool. Here we're going to talk about the prognostic variety. I just wanted to highlight, um, we can also apply prognostic prediction models at the population level. For this work, we'll be focusing on the clinical level. So I've got a little picture of a, of a doc um, probably in the future, as everything is very white in the in the doctor's office here, but you can see that the the doctor is sitting across from their patient, and they've got this risk prediction tool alongside them. So it's something that's meant to be used in to support the physician in their interactions with the patient. It's never meant to. Um, replace a physician or to interfere with that uh, that connection between the, the, the doc and the patient. Um, so these prognostic prediction models also go by a few other names. Um, they've been referred to as risk estimators, risk calculators, and also decision rules. These are kind of different names, sometimes slightly different flavors, but all kind of accessing the same idea of quantifying risk based on some information known about the patient. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and introduce a clinical challenge known as multimorbidity. So this is the coexistence of multiple health conditions within the same patient. Um, and this is a clinical challenge that's faced by patients and the, their providers of health care, especially as they age. We tend to see patients accumulating multiple conditions as they grow older, um, and these conditions persist over time. They're chronic in nature. And so patients with multimorbidity will experience substantial disease burden. They've got multiple diseases going on. They're dealing with the symptoms and the, sequ and the sequelae related to those uh, complicated treatment plans. They've got 
multiple diseases, multiple treatments going on at the same time, it can be difficult to prioritize one condition over another, um, as well as polypharmacy, multiple meds to treat the same patient for multiple conditions um, can get quite complicated as well. So when it comes to understanding multimorbidity and especially multimorbidity risk, it becomes a little bit complicated. Um, ideally, we'd be estimating the risk of multiple diseases in order to estimate the risk of, multi of multimorbidity. However, our existing prediction models will typically focus on one disease and actually assume independence so that this, this disease is independent of any other diseases or disease processes that are going on within the patient. Um, whereas we know that that's not quite often not the case. And actually um, disease has been shown to kind of cluster within patients and, and we'll see these common patterns of diseases. Um, so an example might be diabetes and hypertension occurring together um, and, and, and things like that. So we know that there is there exists some dependence between these diseases that our, our traditional prediction models aren't capturing. So the goal of our work was to, to face this question to, of how do we model dependence that exists Disease, between diseases when we're estimating risk. So the goal of our work was to first understand, is there dependence existing between multiple diseases? We chose diabetes, hypertension, and osteoarthritis to focus on. Um, and I'm going to chat about why in a little bit. And once we've quantified whether or not how much dependence there is between these diseases, we then wanted to be able to model it in order to estimate risk for each of these diseases by accounting for this dependence. And we did that um, using an, a, a copula-based model to, to, to do that. Um, so a little bit on copulas. For a copula, we have, we first construct uh, univariate models, which are models for uh, a single model for each outcome. So that would be in the case of diabetes, hypertension, and osteoarthritis. We'd have a model for diabetes, a model for hypertension, and a model for osteoarthritis. And these would be our traditional risk prediction models that assume independence. But then we'll have some function, and this is known as a copula, that describes the dependence between each of the disease pairs. So we look at each pair of diseases. We have a function that then describes that dependence. And that function allows us then to estimate risk for those diseases while considering the dependence that exists between them. So with this work, we, as I mentioned, we selected diabetes, hypertension, and osteoarthritis. We did so because these diseases each had validated case definitions within our the database that we were working with. And I'm going to chat about, we worked with the SIPSIN database. I'll introduce it a little bit later on. Um, but... We selected these diseases that had these validated case definitions, so we knew that the, the patients who had a diagnosis of this disease, we could rely on those, those cases. Um, as well, we know that diabetes, hypertension, and osteoarthritis are common conditions faced in by Canadian patients, um, so we wanted to prioritize those as well. Um, so we, we use a retrospective cohort of patients that we derived from the SIPSIN database. Um, and we started by assessing each patient at baseline for which risk to see which risk factors they had. 
And then we followed them for five years to detect the incidence of each of these three conditions. A little bit more on the SIPSIN database. This is a, it's, it's called the Canadian Primary Care Sentinel Surveillance Network. And this is an, a network of 12 regional networks that pools electronic medical, medical record data for more than 2 million patients and more than 1,500 primary care practitioners across Canada. And so in this, we've got the coded uh, non-free text data from the elect electronic medical records. Um, the free text isn't available for privacy reasons, but we've got the, the structured coded data, which gives us data around patient demographics, clinical encounters. So we've got diagnostic and procedural codes, uh, medications, laboratory tests, referrals, immunizations. And SIPSIN does some work on their end to clean up the data and make it more ready for research use. So if you're interested, you can follow, you can just do a quick Google of SIPSIN or go to SIPSIN.ca to learn more about and you can request their data through, through from there um, if you're interested in working with it. So from SIPSIN, we selected 425,000 patients. These were patients who didn't have diabetes, hypertension, and osteoarthritis. So they could have one or two of the conditions, but they couldn't have all three. And this ensured that they were at risk of experiencing at least one of our outcomes. Um, and then we selected folks who had some kind of healthcare encounter in 2009 or 2010 and followed them forward from that point for five years. So the cohort that we arrived at was typical of a primary care of what you would expect to see in a primary care population uh, in that it was slightly more likely to be female. This was an older group of, pay, of people and who had higher BMIs. Um, so after five years, we looked to see if people had during that five-year period developed um, each of our different conditions of interest. So for diabetes, about 9% of people went on to develop diabetes, about 4% went on to develop hypertension, and about 3 for osteoarthritis. So we wanted to understand what the what dependence existed between each of these different conditions of interest and we found that indeed there was was dependence between each of these disease pairs um, the strongest dependence was between diabetes and hypertension followed by hypertension and osteoarthritis and then diabetes and osteoarthritis um, and then the second thing we did was we wanted to adjust for risk factors to understand is this, if we adjust for risk factors, so is, is this dependence explained by the risk factors that we have, or is there, is there still some dependence going on after adjusting for risk factors? And we observed that while after adjusting for risk factors, the magnitude of the dependence was reduced. There was still dependence between these uh, different conditions. And so knowing that there was dependence between these different conditions, we wanted to be able to describe that dependence when we're modeling our risk for different patients. And that's why we went on to develop our copula-based model. So as I mentioned, each each outcome, each disease has its own univariate model. Um, we use logistic regression for this, and each model had its own covariates or risk factors included in each model. Um, and there was a fair, there was a decent amount of overlap between the 
risk factors. So age was age contributed risk in each of these models, obesity as well, and then various other comorbidities contributed. So given those univariate models, we were then able to, in essence, tie them together and understand the dependence between these diseases using the copula. So we, we selected what's called the Frank copula. There's, there's all sorts of different copulas that each describe a different type of dependence. And, and we, based on the dependence that we observed, we selected the Frank copula for use. And with this, we then estimated a theta estimate, which defined the magnitude of dependence between those diseases. Um, so we found actually that hypertension in osteoarthritis had the strongest dependence based on the copula model, um, followed by diabetes and hypertension, and then diabetes and osteoarthritis. And this difference compared to the correlation coefficients may be due to some nonlinear dependence existing that the Frank copula is able to capture, but the correlation coefficient wouldn't be captured. So with our copula model that we had developed, we then were able to apply this model to um, some sample patients to kind of understand what, what is the impact on risk among those patients. And do we see do we see a difference? Um, so we we modeled two different scenarios here. Um, so the for each so we could with our different models we could we could describe each different the risk of each combination of outcomes. So it, a person might develop diabetes alone, hypertension alone, or some osteoarthritis alone or some combination thereof, and that's what's described here. And then we estimated the risk of each of those different combinations of outcomes using our copula model, as well as if we were to sequentially apply uh, each univariate model um, without adjusting for the dependence. So if we just applied each model one after the next to understand the risk of that patient, and what we found was that the copula model does make a difference. It does describe some of that dependence and we arrive at a risk estimate that, that describes and accounts for that dependence between diseases. So we arrive at what's hopefully a more accurate understanding of this patient's risk given the copula model. So comparing the two, as I mentioned, um, if we use univariate models, we will be estimating risk using each of these models sequentially. And the final risk estimate that we get doesn't quantify the dependence that exists. It doesn't account for that dependence. Whereas by using the copula-based method that we've proposed, you have a single risk estimator that accounts for that dependence between events, um, giving us a, a simpler method of, of understanding risk and a hopefully more accurate one, given it, it describes this dependence that the, the univariate models aren't able to describe. So with that, I'm gonna pass things over to Jackie. Um, she's going to chat a bit about kind of how this model fits in with other models that are out there and where things are headed from there. So, Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jason. Um, so yeah, we're not going to take like a bunch of steps back and look at kind of the big picture um, of where, how our research sort of fits into the broader field and then a few more things to think about in the future work. So we can get started. Um, if you want, actually, it might be easier if you, do you want to scroll to the fully filled out um, slide and then yeah. I'll just talk through. Oh, yeah. Um, this one's up. Yeah, but if you want, we, may, we can just skip ahead maybe. Yeah, perfect. Cool. Um, and so 
So the first thing to think about is that like there's these two really important in advancing fields and, and there's not maybe as much overlap as we expect. And so on one hand, we have multimorbidity. And as Jason said, you know, it's increasing in prevalence and burden, both for like burden in terms of like an individual person's life and how hard it is to live with multiple conditions, and then also on the healthcare system and then providers um, to care for it. So there's a really high clinical need to support multimorbidity care and prevention. Um, and so there's been a lot of research done in sort of describing these trends and pattern analyses to figure out what's going on. Um, in the populations. There's been some treatment-related research. So for example, polypharmacy that Jason mentioned is right. So if someone has multiple conditions, they may end up with multiple medications and they may interact in not great ways. Um, and then there's been risk factor analyses. And so this is looking at what is associated with an increased risk of multimorbidity, um, which is different than saying what is an individual person's absolute risk of developing it themselves. Um, and so those risk factors are what help to sort of inform the types of things that went in, into the models. Um, but it's not going to tell us for an, someone who maybe is sitting in a, in a clinical encounter, you know, what is their risk of developing something in the future. Um, and then there's also been research looking at, you know, what's the role of, of primary health care in managing multimorbidity? Uh, and it's really, really crucial and really, really foundational. Um, so that's on sort of one side. So that's one, one very important field. And then on the other side, we have this idea of predictive models and like data-driven decision support, which goes by all kinds of different terms. Um, and it's really driven by the way of more and more health data, such as EMRs being available, and then also methods advancements. Um, and I think there's a lot of attention right now towards things like artificial intelligence and machine learning for analyzing these data, which is kind of like even further pushed this idea of like predictive models forward. Um, and so there's tons of models being developed um, for single condition outcomes, um, right? So what's like kind of like Jason said, like if we have just a univariate model for diabetes, for example. Um, and then there's also uh, models being developed for, you know, predicting healthcare use. So, you know, going to the emergency department um, or hospital readmission, these types of things. Um, and anecdotally, it seems like a lot of this work is done in more acute and specialty care settings. So there's not there's not a lot. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that is done at kind of this intersection between primary care, multimorbidity, and predictive models. But we think that one of the barriers um, to having more overlap, as we would sort of expect, is, is the challenging of the methods. Um, and so that's sort of one of the things that we tried to target with our work. So we can go to the next slide now. So, so I'm talking about this like, okay, we have this clinical need, we want to predict multimorbidity, but you might be thinking like, what does that actually really mean, right? Like what is predicting multimorbidity? Because um, by nature, it's sort of just like more than one condition. Um, and that's actually a really, really important point because one of the most important and challenging things whenever setting out to develop a predictive model is like, what is your outcome going to be? Um, and so I'm going to talk more about this in a bit about approaches as sort of operationalizing or conceptualizing multimorbidity as like a single thing or multiple things. But before that, I also just want to note that we've been talking about predictive models at the individual level. Um, so making predictions for, for example, an individual patient with the intention of supporting clinical practice. But there's also been models developed in some work that you can do at sort of the population or public health level that's saying how many people um, in a given area are going to develop multimorbidity. Um, and so you can kind of have two levels to these predictions. Um, so we've been talking about the individual clinical, but some of the examples I'm gonna talk about really briefly are at the population level. Okay, so let's, let's think more about this outcome question. We can go to the next slide. Um, and so sort of the simplest way we can think about, not that it's necessarily simple, but um, straightforward way to, predict multimorbidity is, is to conceptualize multimorbidity as a single event. So this could be like a binary yes, no variable, or it could also be time to some singular event. Um, and so we can think about, okay, let's predict the first condition of a subset of multiple possible conditions. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of pieces of recent work that have worked on that. Um, and so this is useful for saying, okay, we have someone who's currently healthy in terms of all our possible outcome conditions that may develop one or they're gonna develop the first one. And we know that that may lead to future ones. This is like very, very 
early on utility in terms of like the natural history of conditions. Um, but then you might think, okay, but what if I want to sort of broaden um, to people who already may have some of that subset of final conditions? So another way you can do that while still keeping a single event outcome would be say, okay, I want to predict the development of at least one new condition in a subset of multiple possible ones. So kind of like an any of many approach. Um, okay, now I can talk a bit more about multiple event outcomes. So we can go to the next slide. Cool. Um, all right, so there's sort of two, that, and there are a few ways to do this, but I just wanna highlight two. Um, in addition to ours. So one is the idea of Bayesian networks, which kind of come from structure discovery learning. Um, and so it's learning like a joint probability distribution um, from some data. Um, and then you can condition on various other risk factors or other conditions to make predictions about, about different conditions that are there. And so there's been a, a bit of work on that um, in primary care multimorbidity, not specifically tested for individual risk prediction, but the potential is there. And then another sort of way to think about multiple event outcome where we actually want to have sort of like, when I say multiple event, I mean, it's like kind of like what Jason was showing where there's more than one condition that we're looking at kind of individually. Um, and so multitask machine learning is kind of at a high level, this idea that if we have multiple prediction tasks, so for example, trying to predict multiple um, diseases, um, there's similarities between those tasks. Um, and we can kind of harness that to develop like an overall tool um, that will be able to make multiple types of predictions. And then of course, there's the copulate based model, um, which was presented here. Um, that is the approach we took for this one. So yeah, we can move on to the next one. Um, and so I just want to recap like why, why we might want to use this model. Um, and so again, it fits in really nicely with this idea of, okay, we, we know risk factors that we want to use um, and we want to predict multiple conditions, but we need to account for that dependence. And so copula-based models has this sort of really nice way to do that. Um, and we've given an example of how you can do this with three common chronic conditions um, with SIPs and data. And then if anyone's listening who's interested, um, you can check out our paper and use it as like a framework because um, you can develop these models. Really, it's not like a model specific to, to primary care multimorbidity that we showed, but you can use it for different subsets of conditions on the same data or with different data. Um, and so we invite you to sort of think about that and how you may be able to work that into your own research. Okay, and then we can move on to the next slide. Maybe. My internet's really slow, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, no worries. No, that's okay. I can just talk it out um, because really all I was gonna talk about next was a bit of like future work um, or, or some of it we're actively working on. Um, and so one of those points is sort of thinking about how can we extend these sort of feature-based methods where we have like concrete risk factors um, to capture more complex types of relationships and information from data. And sort of a side question that we're working on with that is, um, how do we know when it's worth it to make that step? Um, because you lose some interpretability, um, your computation costs go way up. Um, and we think with something like multimorbidity, there's probably a lot of advantage because it is so complex. Um, but we also don't just want to do way more complex models for the sake of doing more complex models um, because you can end up actually losing a lot in the process. Um, and so we're, we're piloting that with a bit of a kind of like an any of many type approach with sort of four conditions that were identified as priorities. Um, and the other thing that sort of worked into this work is, is more iterative model development with end users. Um, so, you know, starting with, you know, what is important um, to predict and how do we kind of go back and forth a bit throughout the model development stage to make sure that the end product is something that really um, is useful and tangible, and then moving into actual pilot testing and evaluation studies in clinical practice. Um, because that, which is just super, super important, is like I said, there's a ton of predictive models being developed, but 
there's far less research looking at how do we actually evaluate and pilot test these and what actually happens to things like clinical workflow um, uh, and patient outcomes sort of longer down the line. Um, and then a final point that not actively going on right now, but working with some other people who are, who are more involved in it, is this whole idea of risk communication um, and shared decision-making. So let's say we have the, you know, the best possible model and we've got it implemented in practice seamlessly. You know, if we can't figure out the best ways to communicate those risk scores to people in a way that's actually going to support that sort of collaborative decision making, um, you know, we've kind of in the end lost a lot of potential benefit there. Um, cool. We have gotten to that slide. So there's a, we have just presented this ongoing and future work. Uh, and then, yeah, we can we can skip ahead to our acknowledgements, potentially. But um, if not, we could also just go to questions. But we do want to say a big thank you to Drs. Dan Lazat, Amanda Terry, and Sonny, Sonny Sijic, um, who contributed to this work. Um, and then we have our contact information and, again, our little QR code if you just want to scan that and be, and be you know, placed at where our paper is. So thank you so much. And I'm going to hand it back over to, to Jason now for the question period. Well, I'll be here too, but it's going to be the, the primary. Great. Thanks very much, sure. uh, Jason and Jackie. Uh, we do have a few questions for you. Shall I just begin or did you want to close with anything else, J Jason? No, go right on, on ahead. Thanks, Okay. Anna. So there's a question about um, why you chose the Frank Copula method. You mentioned there were others. And we're just wondering why you chose that one. So the, the Frank copula we chose because it does a good job of modeling weak dependence. So when we looked at the dependence that exists between our different outcomes, we saw that it exhibits weak dependence, especially um, at the tails of the, of the distribution. So this is something that the Frank copula does really well. So that's where that's that was the rationale that that drove that. Great, thanks very much. Uh, next question: How did you manage the different types of diabetes, or was it uh, any diabetes? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, a really good point, um, and that is one of the limitations of our research as it is right now. Um, currently, the case definition for Diabetes includes both type 1 and type 2, and there's no way to distinguish between the two of them. Um, I am aware of some work going on with SIPSIN data that's looking at understanding the differences, so identifying those two have it's either type 1 or type 2, I did, but distinguishing between the type 1s and type 2s, and I think that's actually using a, a more machine learning approach. Um, but so for this current work, um, it does not distinguish between type 1 and type 2, but in the future, that's definitely something that we would want to add because we know that type 2 is where risk is is where most of the interest in risk is because there's more modifiable risk factors for type two. There's more things that we can do to kind of intervene and, and reduce that risk. Whereas for type one, it's typically uh, more genetically based. It's a, you know, a, a younger onset of the condition. So there's less that we can do to, to intervene there. So that's a really good point. Great. Thanks, Jason. So yeah, he was just clarifying. Thanks for expanding on that. So thank you. Um, next question. Uh, using the simulated patient example, how do you interpret the risk estimates obtained using the Frank Copula method? Right. Um, so the rest, the risk estimates that we obtain um, will quantify how likely somebody is to, to move on to develop these um, combinations of, of conditions. So we can, so with knowledge of the, the risk of 
uh, of a given condition, we can hopefully target that person with interventions to then decrease the risk. Um, I'm not aware of whether if if we're looking specifically at the Frank copula, if we need to kind of consider that when we're interpreting the risk, or if if we just have that risk score and then we can make of it what we will. But I think I think underlying all of this is is understanding it's this method allows us to understand an ind individual patient's risk and then hopefully intervene upon that risk um, with interventions that we know um, will help reduce risk. Yeah, thanks for that question. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, how do you see your prediction model being used in clinical encounter? So that, I kind of just described that um, but I'll, I'll describe it a little bit further. So this would be something that's used in a clinical encounter. Ideally, we, this would be something that would be developed into the EMR, um, which given that we use electronic medical record data, that lends itself really well to being deployed in that setting um, given because we, we know that we'll have access to the same, to the same variables that were used to derive these models. So, um, we kind of see it being situated in the EMR and it could be used kind of ad hoc when the, when the patient or the physician is interested in risk, but it also might operate in the background as, as a flag for you have your patient come in, um, and we, and the, 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 the EMR flags that this patient is at risk of a given outcome. Um, so this would be used to kind of supplement and help help the physician make these make decisions around risk during the clinical encounter. Great, thank you. Uh, next question: Does an observed dependence between outcomes reflect shared risk factors or a common underlying pathological process? That's a really good question. The, the method that we used adjusts for, adjusts for the dependence between those risk factors. So ideally, the, the dependence that we're, that we're observing is, is either due to either our, the covariates that we are including in our model are not fully describing the dependence that exists, and then we're not fully adjusting for that dependence, or there is some, some kind of physiologic mechanism at play that, that puts you at, at higher risk of both. Um, and that's something I don't think that is fully understood. Um, and quite likely it's both. I think it's probably the fact that I don't think that our, our covariates are fully describing it. There's limitations. We're not ask, ask, accessing all of the potential risk factors because we don't have the data in the EMRs to do that. Um, and then on the flip side, there probably are some underlying processes that would put you at risk of both of these, both of these conditions. So it's probably both. Um, the advantage of our, our model is that it, it doesn't matter which type of dependence it is, it's going to describe it. And then we're going to be constructing risk estimates that are based on that understanding of the dependence. Um, so if you were applying this in a causal setting, you would, you would definitely want to be very aware of that and try to suss that out, try to really understand that. And, and certainly the, we tried to, to the extent that we could, um, and really, and really include by including causal, causal predictors in our model. And, um, but we do know that we are, we are predicting and as by describing that dependence, our risk predictions are then informed by it. Great. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, your work sounds like artificial intelligence. Are you aware of any ways that AI is used in healthcare? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm actually going to pass this over to Jackie. She's done quite a bit of work in the AI sphere. So I'll pass this cool. over to you, Jackie. Okay, sounds good. Um, so yeah, so I think I think the key thing is I I'm not one who cares a ton about, you know, where's the actual line between like what definitionally counts as AI, but we are making predictions and that's something that AI is primarily used to do a lot of the time. Um, and so there's lots of ways um, that AI is is being developed and designed and tested. In healthcare, we've done a recent scoping review on AI uses our research for primary care specifically. Um, and so if anyone's interested in that, shoot me a note and I will uh, send you the link to that. Uh, and one of the things we found there though is that there's not actually a lot of evaluation or, or implemented AI in primary care specifically. So that kind of ties back into my point that I think there's a bit of a gap um, in primary care AI uses with respect to in other sectors um, of healthcare or just sort of the world in general. Um, so yes, uh, happy to chat more. Yeah, thanks for the question. Great, thank you. And this is some somewhat related question. It says, take up and use of these prediction tools in clinical practice is variable. You also mentioned the risk communication was a potential issue. Are copula models better understood by clinicians and or easier to communicate to patients? If so, will this increase their use in clinical practice? So maybe I'll 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 jump in and say something and then and then Jason can come in after. Um, I, I think that compared to, for example, like a, a deep neural network where it's like completely a black box model. Um, where you don't really know what's going on, the copula-based models are going to be much, much more interpretable. And I think that's going to tie into this idea of, of trust and understanding what's going on, not only so that a clinician feels comfortable using the tool, but also so that they're better enabled to identify if something seems a little off um, and then try to be, investigate a bit why maybe. Um, and so I think that probably there's going to be a mix and it's going to be very context dependent. I think that's one of the biggest advantages though of sort of feature-based approaches and then the copula-based model over some sort of really, really complex machine learning model where you can't sort of know what those underlying relationships are um, is that I think the comfort with it will be much better. And that's sort of like where you want to have this collaborative work um, to engage with end users to figure out what they're comfortable with, what they think, if things are making sense to them. Um, so yeah, Jason has anything to add, but it's my two cents. No, I think I think you summed that up really nicely. I think that when we've got these these models that are derived from risk factors, you can see you can see the the degree to which each risk factor. Um, contributes to the risk for an individual patient by looking at the parameter estimates that are estimated by the model. So it's it's certainly more interpretable than something that's kind of drawing upon data-driven techniques that are that might be like similarity approaches. So how similar are you to somebody else who has experienced the outcome? Um, but that it does get at a really good point here, and that's where this work will need to go. Is how do we how do we explain this to physicians? How do we explain this to patients? And then how can they use this information, this knowledge gained in their practice? It's a really good point. Yeah, and just actually one more thing to to follow up is I think it's like you kind of can look at the performance metrics you know if you have two models and they both perform very similarly so they're both like similar in terms of like sensitivity specificity accuracy whatever part of these predictions I think most of the time you're going to want to pick the more interpretable one whatever that may be 
Um, so. Great, thank you. And, and Bruce says, thank you very much for answering his question. Um, is there open source code for your models? Yep, so you can find if you follow the QR code in the corner there, um, you can find our publication and we've included the code that we used for this, this application in there. Um, so you feel free to kind of repurpose that, retool it um, with your applications. Great, thanks very much. That's wonderful. Um, and we've talked a bit about your models, but I wonder if you can just maybe expand a bit how you aro arose at the, uh, and derived the features you included in your model. You talked a bit about it, but I don't know if you want to expand a bit on that. Sure. So, so as I as I mentioned briefly, um, the features that we included in our model, the risk factors that we looked at. Um, we first looked to the existing evidence around risk for each of these different conditions and selected risk factors that had um, a considerable amount of support, um, of, a, a, some evidence suggesting that these things might be associated with, with each of the outcomes. Um, we consulted with clinicians um, to make sure that the, what we were including in our models kind of made sense to them as these things might increase risk. Um, and then we looked to the EMR database, um, which when you're working with EMR data, you have to, there's a lot that goes into case, case, um, case definition construction. So kind of constructing these concepts within the EMR that are flags for real conditions. So I, I talked about it with um, the SIPs invalidated ones, but for the different uh, risk factors that we included in our, in our models, if there was a validated case definition, we used that. If there wasn't, we looked at what other folks had done to kind of understand these, these conditions within EMRs. Um, and we looked at the data and we, again, consulted with our clinical folks to say, to understand like how they would code it in the EMR, um, how they would expect to see these conditions within the, the EMR and risk factors. Um, and that ended up with our final risk factors. Um, we tried to keep everything continuous so that everything retained as much information as possible um, and yeah so that was that was kind of the process that went, went into that great thank you very much um, I don't see any further questions here I think we're almost at about time I certainly would like to thank both of you for presenting today and sharing uh, the wealth of knowledge in terms of your work and uh, the code that you've made available um, also your suggestions around data and where people might go to get to uh, to get more data to work on this kind of work. Um, anything else you'd like to just tell us about your future projects or where you're going next? Um, Taki, did you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, I'm so I'm like, I'm doing my PhD. My PhD is developing new methods for multimorbidity risk prediction. Um, and so hopefully, and that's sort of where that side question is, we're kind of like, you know, if we start with logistic regression and we start adding on these more complex techniques, what happens? Um, is it worth it knowing these computational costs uh, skyrocket? So uh, so yeah, we're, we're going there. So watch out for that. I'm, I'm happy to chat with anyone who's interested about that. Um, and that's sort of, I guess, my thing. We're doing that with the uh, Alliance for Healthier Communities, um, which is community health centers in Ontario. Um, and they're really interested in this kind of idea of a learning health system and how can they use their data and learnings from that to, to continuously improve practice. And so it's just so exciting to get to work with an organization that is really keen to figure out, you know, how do we do this well um, for, our, for our population specifically? Um, so yeah, so Great. watch out for that, I guess. So let me know if you have questions or comments or suggestions. 
Great. Thanks so much uh, again, Jason and Jackie, and thanks for your contact information and coding for your reports. And uh, as everyone knows, we'll have the recording up on our website in the next week or so. So thanks again, and thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thanks so much, Anne. Thanks, everyone, yeah. for joining. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Bye for now.